Hey guys, uh, Mr. Davis here. So I want to go ahead and I want to talk about something that might be a little bit of a review, but I'm going to kind of hint at how this plays to larger systems on Earth. So we need to talk about convection. Um, and to put it simply, convection is all about the motion of fluids as a result of heat. All right. So a couple things I want to clarify really quickly before I do anything else. When I say fluid, what I mean is anything that can flow. So that can be a liquid, but it could also be a gas. All right. Um, it can be things that are kind of weirdly semi-solid and, you know, gelatinous like jello, basically. Jello could almost be considered a fluid. All right. So let's go ahead and see how convection affects these different uh, things. All right. So first off, we need to go ahead and make sure we define convection. So convection is the circulation of heat in a fluid. All right. Now, there are other ways that heat is transferred, and I want to clear those up here really quickly. So conduction is the transfer of heat through direct contact. So convection would be the water inside a pot of boiling water. If you ever look at a pot of water as it boils, you'll see that you've got water rising to the surface and it's that bubbling, rolling action that you have in a boiling pot of water. But conduction is what you would find if you were to grab the handle of that pot directly. So that is transfer of energy through the direct contact of two materials. And then lastly, you have something that is radiation. Radiation is a little different. That is the transfer of energy through space as a wave. So the best example of this is infrared radiation, which is just hot light, basically. Okay, so different wavelengths of light. And you can experience all of these things right here in Arizona. Just step outside when it's 110 degrees outside and you'll experience them really quickly. So conduction would be how you burn your feet if you walk outside in socks or uh, without shoes or something like that to go to the pool. Um, radiation is how you can notice that it is much hotter when you're out in the sunlight versus in the shade. And then convection, well, that would be, say, you hop into the pool and you notice that it's kind of warm on the surface, but the bottom of the pool is nice and cool away from that. But as things happen, it starts to circulate. Okay, so um, that is convection, conduction, radiation. All right. Today, though, what I'm going to do and in the next couple of slides is I'm going to focus very heavily on convection. So convection currents are usually going to move in a circle and I'm going to show you how they flow. So let's take a look at this example of a convection current right here. So you have the ground, which is warm. OK, it's warm because you have uh, that radiation from the sun striking it and you've got the layer of air directly above it, which is going to absorb some of the heat from the ground. All right. So as that air heats up, it's going to expand and become less dense, so it will rise. And most liquids, as they warm, they become less dense and they will rise up into the air or up above whatever fluid they're in. All right. So they will rise up through the uh, column of air in this case. But then as they get away from their heat source, they'll cool back down. So in this case, the ground is what's transferring the most heat. OK, and that will then cool and sink back down to the ground. All right. So you have this circular motion of heating and cooling and heating and cooling. All right. So as liquids or gases cool, they condense, come back down and become more dense and sink. So where this can be a practical application is right here with a hot air balloon. The air inside the balloon is being heated up and trapped inside that balloon. As that air becomes warmer and warmer and warmer, it is less dense. So that balloon is less dense than the surrounding air mass and it will float up into the sky then. Now, 
The thing is, hot air balloons work best early in the morning when the air is cool because it is easier to have that inside amount of air, the air inside the balloon, be hotter than the air around the outside of it. And that's what you want. You want a warmer mass of air inside than outside so that the air in the balloon is less dense and it floats up. You also have this as air circulation in buildings. Um, in buildings where you have your cooling vents close to the, uh, to the ground, that cool air will get stuck and trapped and trap there. So that's why a lot of times in modern buildings, the air conditioning vents are placed up in the ceiling so that cold air will sink down into there and the hot air will rise and you'll get an exchange of air through that uh, building. All right, so let's see how this then applies to some earth systems. So the thing to remember is the earth does not heat evenly. All right, um, different materials will absorb radiation from the sun at different rates. So on the last thing I showed you, you saw that I said, oh, well, the ground is gonna heat up faster than the air. Well, yeah. That's because air allows most radiation to just pass right through it without interacting. That's why the light is able to pass through the air, whereas the ground is opaque and it absorbs all that energy from the light. So the ground heats up faster than the air, but then that hot ground is gonna warm the air above it. But even different types of ground heat up differently. So you can, again, notice this. So metal and concrete and things like that, they heat up very rapidly and they absorb and hold a lot of heat and they can get really, really hot if they have sun shining on them. At the same time though, water and plants will oftentimes be cooler. This is why, um, you know, here in Arizona, walking to the pool, you can burn your little feet very easily on that deck around the pool, but the water itself in the pool generally is gonna be a good bit cooler. Or sometimes if you have to walk somewhere barefoot for whatever reason, I mean, you shouldn't really go outside barefoot in Arizona anyway, but it might be cooler on the grass than it would be on you know, asphalt or concrete or things like that. Additionally though, I do wanna say, if we're talking about the whole earth, there are parts of the earth that are gonna warm faster than others. So we probably already know this, but around the equator, you know, for us in the Northern Hemisphere, as you go south, it gets warmer. But um, the equator is gonna be generally the warmest part. And then as you go farther away from the equator, north or south towards the poles, it gets colder. So North Pole, South Pole, cold, equator, usually very warm, all right? And we'll talk about why that's gonna be. And that has to do with incident solar radiation, which is a whole fun term to look up. So some parts of the earth will be warmer than others both because of their distance from the equator and what kind of ground cover they have but we can actually have an effect on this as well so in areas where you have more uh, plants more ground cover that is um, water or is um, able to release moisture through evaporation and things like that it will generally be cooler and the earth will and the surface will absorb less heat. However, when you get to places like urban areas where you have a lot of concrete, a lot of steel, a lot of buildings, the buildings and the concrete will absorb a lot of heat. You don't have a lot of evaporation and um, very, very little of this is reflected back off. So you have this very hot material here and it will stay hot longer. Um, this is why in areas near cities, a lot of times it'll stay hotter at night than it does out in the country, out in the surrounding area. This is also why it's oftentimes hotter in the center of a city versus out uh, away from the city. And we can see this here in the valley. It's much, much cooler if you go over uh, to the areas um, outside, like where the Salt River is and um, up where the Bush Highway extends up through um, towards Canyon Lake and those kind of places versus downtown Phoenix where it can get much, much warmer. Um, so that is how uh, ground cover as well as location on the earth is going to change this system. All right, so let's link these two together. So let's imagine a coastline. All right, remember how I said water is gonna heat up slower and land's gonna heat up faster. Okay, many times when you are near an ocean, you will get a breeze 
at night or in the afternoon, and it's called a sea breeze, all right? It's wind coming off the ocean. What's happening here? Well, during the daytime where there is sunshine, the land heats up more quickly than the sea. So as that hot air rises over land, it pulls air up, but nature does not want to have a vacuum there, okay? If you scoop out you know, air or water from a container, um, you don't have a divot where it used to be. Instead, the material around there is gonna flow into it. The liquid around there or fluid's gonna flow into it, okay? So what we have is you have air rushing in to take the place of this hot air that rose. So cooler air comes in over the, uh, from the ocean. And then as that heats up, it will rise and it will cool eventually up in the upper atmosphere and then descend back down and you'll get this circulating current, all right? So during the day when there's sunshine, the land heats up more quickly than the sea above the land, warm air rises and the wind blows towards the coast, all right? So that is what forms a sea breeze, and it's this circulating air mass. Well, if you live near the ocean, that's great, but we don't live near the ocean here in Arizona, but we still get wind. Well, there's a bigger system at play here. The whole Earth follows this same pattern. Our whole planet is actually dictated by these convection currents. They actually shape our global climate and they exchange air across the entire surface of the planet. So you have convection cells, sometimes called a Hadley cell. That's specifically the convection cell that is just north or just south of the equator. It's caused by hot air rising. So you can see how the hot air rises here and you get little clouds here because a lot of times you get thunderstorms because that hot air evaporates a lot of moisture and as it rises, um, sometimes it just to get to the higher levels of the atmosphere, it's got to lose some weight. So it drops the moisture back out of it. So as it rises up into the air, it dries out, it cools off way up in the upper uh, troposphere, the upper layer, first layer of the atmosphere. It cools down and it descends and comes down at about 30 degrees north latitude. Well, look where 30 degrees north latitude is, all right? That cuts right through southern Arizona, through part of Florida right there. If you extend this all the way around over here to Africa, which you can just barely see on this picture here, well, guess what? That's where the Sahara Desert is. Okay. So we're still far enough south or north, and so we're still close enough to the equator, so we're gonna get a lot of solar radiation, still gonna be a lot of energy from the sun, but we're getting this dry air from the upper atmosphere descending. So you get heat from the surface because it's absorbing a lot of radiation, but dry air from cold uh, convection currents coming down, so you have a hot, dry area and you find deserts there. Wait a minute, that's gonna shape the climate of the area. So this is actually gonna change the weather. So you have fewer storms in this region, more storms here, and then as that air heats up again and moves north, you're gonna get more weather, more storms up north as well. So you have these bands that alternate back and forth of storm, dry, storms, dry, and that goes up the surface of our earth. And this will actually shape our biomes. So when we start to talk about biomes, we're gonna to have to look at how far north or south of the equator they are. Then that determines how much water they get and that determines the type of organisms that can live there. So let's take a look at how this then shapes our whole global climate. Well, this crazy circulating pattern here that you have around, this, uh, around our planet this is all part of that circulation of air. You have air rising in some areas as it heats up and air descending in other areas as it cools down. Okay, so you have hot air rising at the equator. It cools and descends down and gets circulated here uh, north of about 30 degrees. As it warms up again, it rises again and then cools again and drops down on the poles. And that is mirrored down along the South Pole as well. So both poles 
are actually going to get cold, dry air descending on them, so they don't get a lot of uh, snow as a result. Uh, meanwhile, you've got a lot of rain at the equator, and you've got forests and a number of rainy areas that are uh, between that 30 degrees north and, th and 60 degrees north, or 30 degrees south and 60 degrees south. And this actually shapes what organisms live where, all right? This is a huge system, all right? It is a complicated system. But I wanted to introduce convection first because that simple understanding that hot air or any warm fluid is going to rise, cooler fluids are going to condense and sink, and they're gonna move in a circular pattern, that's gonna help, under, help you understand and help unlock a lot of information about how different systems on the earth behave. This is going to affect how we understand our geosphere, our geosphere which is the rocks and the molten rock inside the earth because it's a fluid. Our atmosphere so we'll understand how the air circulates on our planet and I've already started to introduce that here. Our hydrosphere how water circulates on our planet because the temperature of that water is going to change as it travels across the globe, and that's going to cause it to rise or sink in the water column. And then lastly, those changes in temperature, water availability, nutrient availability even, are going to affect our biosphere, and that's going to determine what organisms can live where. So convection is what drives all of these different systems on earth and it is the reason why you can have these different living organisms on our planet that you don't have anywhere else that we know of all right so just to review this is only one system all right convection is the circulation of fluids based on heat as they warm up they will rise as they cool they will sink um, as any fluid moves out because of um, it rising or falling, other fluid will rush in to replace it. So hot air rising, you'll get ground level winds coming in to replace it. Cold air descending, you'll have high altitude jet streams coming in to replace it. All right. Fluid will always flow to replace the rising or falling mass. I really should say falling mass. All right. Um, and this will drive global wind and weather patterns. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop there. What we need to uh, make sure that we are clear on is how convection works because um, next when we come back, I'm gonna start talking about the atmosphere. I'm gonna talk about its structure, its layers, and how it moves around our planet. Okay, that's all for today, guys. I want you to take care, you have a great day, and I'll see you next time, bye.